Many of you have already been down the road of realizing that your days, years certainly, with your children are numbered. And you don't know, and I don't know exactly where God will take them. But as I start to, to think about being a father, and as we start to look towards Father's Day, I start thinking about, well, what does it mean to be a father to sons? We're going to talk for the next few Sundays about uh, what it means to be a Christian man. And then we'll talk for a little while about what it means to be a Christian woman. And I don't know if you had a father that perhaps took you out fishing and told you great lessons of life that he had been passed down from his father. I don't know if you had wonderful influences of godly men in your life. Um, it's a wonderful thing if you have that, but not everyone has that. And our culture is very confused on what it means to be a man. I'm sure that you're aware of that. They, they try and, and either overemphasize and try and be hyper-masculine, and you have a, a whole movement where you have to be absolutely ripped and well-dressed and wealthy, and if you're not the alpha dog in every situation, if you're not getting after it at 4.30 a.m. in the gym, then, then you're not a man. And then you have the other side of it where people are being trained not to be men because men are toxic, and their strength is dangerous. And so we would rather have weak men than to be put in danger. And so let's make all of our men weak. There's confusion out there. And I think about I have sons that I'm trying to raise. And I, and I wonder, as, as my days are getting fewer and fewer with them in my home, realizing more and more that, that certain eras in their life are already past, what is it that I want to leave with them? What does it even mean to be a man after God's own heart? You know, there are definitely differences between boys and girls, right? I'm not talking about the obvious. I'm talking about, have you ever raised boys and girls? How many of you uh, had a sibling that was of the opposite sex? You had a sibling in the household with you that was of the opposite sex. All right. How many of you ever parented both boys and girls? How many of you ever grandparented boys and girls, right? Right? So you realize that there are some differences that they come with, right? Factory settings. That's, that's how they were born, Right? Um, when, when I think about their differences, I realize that God made them that way. That's not an accident. That was on purpose. And we need our young men, our, our boys, really, to become men, and we need our young ladies to become women. And so either we will allow the world to tell us what that means, and it's ever-changing, or we'll find out what a man really is, according to God, and how we become one. And I had a completely different direction I was going with this. I don't know, for those of you that have ever brought a Bible message or a Bible lesson, if God has ever changed your direction after you thought you knew what you were going to speak on. But one day in my, my private devotions, I hope you have a time where you spend time alone with God every day, reading your Bible and praying. I came across something, and God just shot my sermon idea. It was dead. It could not be revived. Because I thought I knew what I wanted to preach on because I was reading these books about masculinity and, and I, I thought. And then I came upon these verses in Jeremiah chapter 9. Jeremiah chapter 9. In verse number 23. Jeremiah chapter 9 in verse number 23. The Bible reads... Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight saith the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, I pray in this hour that you would do the illuminating work of your spirit to help those that know you to surrender themselves to what you have to say. And for those that don't yet know you, may they be drawn to salvation. And may today be the glad day when they step into eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Jeremiah is dealing with a hard time in the nation and in the time of God's people. Their, their people were in decline and going into captivity. 
and sadly they deserved it society in general general had abandoned god and the truth of god's word and had walked away from it and when they did that god took his hand of protection off of that nation and they were taken by their enemies and in hard days he preaches these words on what it is that god loves now if you and i were to talk about the things that people glory in by the way what does it mean to glory in something it means to celebrate it, it means to boast about it it means to find your satisfaction in your happiness in it um, there there are jokes about certain hobbies or eating styles that are always brought up they're like how do you know if somebody does crossfit wait a little while they'll tell you about it right how do you know if somebody's a vegan wait a little while they'll tell you about it it's this joke about people that are very excited about certain things because in that thing, perhaps they found their satisfaction and their happiness. And as we think about what it is that God delights after, what it is that puts a smile on God's face, the Lord has some instructions for us on, on what a man is like. And he says at the very beginning of this verse, in verse number 23 of Jeremiah 9, he says, Thus saith the Lord, Meaning there's other people that are speaking and there's other voices that are out there and you can listen to certain podcasts and you can read certain books and you can watch certain influencers. You can hear what their opinion happens to be on these things, but then God comes in and he weighs in on it, speaking with the authority of the one who created the universe, who hung the stars in the sky, who created the beauty that you and I live in every day, the complexity of the cycle that provides for all of our needs down to the very deep parts of physics and biology that we're only starting to even get a glimpse at and when we see this god this god weighs in on the matter and he speaks to us and he tells us something that we did not perhaps expect let not the wise man glory in his wisdom so there are men and women that are wise we're thinking today mostly about men because that's how god has brought it up in this passage they are smart they have great capacity of mind they not only know things but they know how to use the things that they know and there's a difference. You ever met somebody that knew a bunch of stuff, but they didn't know what to do with it? I encountered a lot of these people in academia where they had a lot of knowledge up here, but they didn't know how to live life. Wisdom is more than just knowing facts. Wisdom is knowing how to use those facts. And wisdom is a powerful thing. There's man's wisdom, and then there's God's wisdom. And God says, even if you have wisdom, even if you have his wisdom, this is not the thing that you boast about. This is not the thing that you necessarily celebrate and that you hang your hat on and say, this is why I am satisfied in my life and this is why I am happy. Now, is it good to be wise? Yes, it is good to be wise. Absolutely. God says that if any man lack wisdom, that we can come to him and ask of him and he will give it to all of us liberally. He will generously give out wisdom. So wisdom is not a bad thing, but it is not enough. Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Strength, skill, capacity to get things done. There's a, a military podcaster that I like to listen to. He's also uh, in excellent shape, has a bunch of supplements out there that you can take if you exercise. And even if you don't exercise, I'm sure he sells quite a bit of them to the people that want to exercise. He's written books on leadership, and he's always talking about get after it, right? You'll see on his Facebook, on his Instagram, he'll have a snapshot of his watch at 4.36 a.m., and you can see the drops of sweat on the floor of his home gym <laughs> and his kettlebells and his, his weighted bats and combat sticks and all of this stuff that's on there. And you can tell that that man, even though that he is retired now from special forces and is impressive, I most certainly wouldn't want to try and fight him, despite the age difference, that that man celebrates and finds his satisfaction on what he is able to do with his body. Now, should we take care of our bodies? Absolutely. Should we eat well? Absolutely. Should we exercise? Absolutely. You say, I'm liking this message less and less. This is the body in which you and I are going to serve our God. This is the body in which you and I are going to serve our families, and this is the body in which you and I are going to serve our friends and our co-workers, and there's something to be said about taking care of it so that we can do more 
in order to please God and to serve others. I won't, I won't say there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think men ought to, if they're able to, I think they ought to be strong and they ought to take care of themselves. There are some things that happen in this world that we wish could be different and that we wish we could change. This past week, there was a tragedy in our own home city of North Olmsted here where someone was attacked in broad daylight for no reason that anyone's been able to, to figure out and a toddler lost their life because somebody that should not have been out walking around free was out walking around free. And these things happen quickly. And you actually, when you see something horrific like what happened, your mind takes perhaps a long time to realize, is this actually happening? Is this going on? And unless you've been trained by law enforcement or unless you've been trained by military in order to have the reactions necessary to jump into action, we all want to think that if we had been there, we would have jumped in and stopped things. But it's such an unusual thing to come face to face with violence. I, I should say it was more of an unusual thing to come face to face with violence. But it seems like instead of getting better, things are getting worse. And we need strong men. We need strong men. By the way, strong men are not as dangerous as weak men. Weak men have something to prove, and they feel their inadequacy. And because they have not found it, their strength in the body that God has given them and in the skill of using that body, they seek to find that power over others in cowardly, manipulative, violent ways. Dangerous but good is perhaps a thing that we should aim for as God's men. Dangerous, not necessarily in the sense that you're going to fly off the handle, but you're going to stand up for what is true and what is right and what is good, even if it costs you something, even if it makes you unpopular, even if people do not understand and slander your character, even if it feels like you're fighting upstream, you stand and you do it anyway. That kind of might is valuable, but it is not enough. And God says, that is not what you're going to boast in. He says, let not the rich man glory in his riches. This is not going to make great content for some of these influencers that love to show off their cars and their clothing and their watches, the restaurants that they eat at, the phones that they have. This is not going to make great content for them because they want you to think that they are happy and successful because they have money. Is money evil? No. Money is not evil, but the love of it has caused many troubles. Even for God's people, it's like they've been pierced, the Bible says, asunder through it, that they have been hurt because they have chased after riches instead of after the God who gives riches. There's nothing wrong with money. In fact, God's ministry takes money to function, and we can do great things with money. But there are some people that think because they have dollar signs around their portfolios and their banks and their net worth. By the way, what a terrible phrase. What is your net worth? Does that mean that if you don't have a lot of money, you're not worth anything? The rich man might come to that conclusion. But as we learned this morning in our Bible teaching Sunday school hour, that you and I were made in the image of God, and so we have value and worth. Regardless of where we fall in society, whether we're on the top of it or on the bottom of it, or to the side of it, ostracized. We have value because God made us in his image. But the rich man might be tempted to say, because I have this car, I am happy. And because I have these clothes, I am happy. And because I can write a check and buy you, I have won. And yet God says, though it's not wrong to be wise, that even if you are wise, don't boast in it. And there's nothing wrong with being mighty. In fact, David, King David, had mighty men all around him that God greatly used. But that's not enough by itself. Don't boast in that. Don't boast in riches. You say, well, then we shouldn't boast at all. I, I understand, Pastor, then we shouldn't boast at all. No. Verse 24, but let him that glorieth glory in this. If you're going to celebrate something, if you're going to get excited about something, this is the thing that you ought to be excited about. What does God say that a man that's after his own heart should be excited about, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That he understandeth and knoweth me. That you have an intimate knowledge of not just who God is, but that you know him. There's a great difference in knowing about somebody and knowing somebody. I know about George Washington. I do not know George Washington. 
right? That little change in our language means such a difference. And there are people that know about God, but they do not actually know him. They do not have that close relationship with him. And you and I come to know God because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done, that we might come to him. You see, God wants us to glory and to glorify his name. In fact, he created us for that reason. He wanted to have fellowship with us. He wanted to pour out his goodness on somebody, which happened to be us, that we might in return give him the glory that's due unto his name. He wants us to glory, and he says, this is what we ought to glory in, that we know him. How can sinners know a holy God? How can sinners know a holy, holy God? You say, well, the really bad people probably can't. I've got terrible news for you. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There are none righteous, no, not one. There are none that seek after God. If we have kept the law in every point, yet offend in one, we are guilty of all. You see, all of us are separated from God by our sin. Sin is any time that we think or speak or do something that is against what God has said. Either God says, don't do this bad thing, and we do it anyway. Or God says, do this good thing, and we say, I can't be bothered to do that. That sin, and that sin separates us from God. Just like if you were to introduce a little sin into your relationships in this world, it would create distance. Our sin has separated us from God. You say, how is it that we can come to know him when we have sadly sinned and made ourselves distant from him? It's because the Lord Jesus Christ has bridged that gap. You see, when we were sinners and we deserved to be punished for our sin, God looked upon us. Even before the world was made, he knew that we would end up in this situation. And God said, I will give my son. And the Lord Jesus says, I will lay down my life that you and I might have the forgiveness of sins and that we might have new life in him. And that though we deserve the hell and punishment that we were on our way towards, he said, I will save them. And so he sent a savior. And so now sinful men, sinful women can come to know a holy God because of the price that was paid to make us clean, the price that was paid to cover our sin when the Lord Jesus did that for himself. He says, this is what you can get excited about, that you know me and that I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. I had, I had some ideas on what I wanted to preach about when I was going to talk about Christian manhood. I was starting to think I was going to go through different men in the Old Testament and the, the virtues of, of manhood that they demonstrated. I was going to think about the different kings and the warriors and the, and the prophets and the priests, and I was going to highlight certain things about their lives. But you know what some of those things were? Strength, wisdom. And God's like, nope. That's not even right. He says, this is what I get excited about. What I delight in, what puts a smile on my face, are these things. Loving kindness. He says, judgment. And he says, righteousness. These are not the three things I would have picked out. I had three days in mind that we would speak on this on Sundays, and God said, these are the things that I get excited about. I do these things, God says, and I love those that do them. And if you're going to be a man, that you're not going to boast in these things up above, your wisdom, your might, your might, or your riches, but in loving kindness, judgment and righteousness. You say, loving kindness, that, that sounds a little wishy-washy. Loving kindness sounds a little feel good. And if you're going to be a, a strong man, I don't know if there's any room for that. I would beg to differ. If you don't have this, you will not be the right kind of man. This is God's loyal love. His loyal love to his people is shown in his loving kindness. You see, this is kindness born out of his heart for us. The reason that he made promises to his people and kept them are because of his loyal love. The reason that he delivered his people from their enemies and famine and destruction is because of his loyal love. The reason that he stands between them and evil is his loyal love. It's love in action. It's love that protects and it's love that provides. It's a love that shows mercy. 
and covers a multitude of sins. You see, why does, why does the man that has to stand between those that he loves and evil, why does he do that? Is it because he hates evil that much? I would say rather it's because he loves who stands behind him. And that is why he's willing to do it. And in the same way, God does not delight in the death of the wicked. And so when he stood between the children of Israel and their enemies, it's not because he wanted to destroy them. It grieved the heart of God. He says that God is, the Bible says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, even those that are wicked. God who will have all men to be saved. In fact, the Lord Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. And so God doesn't want any to be saved, any to be lost. He wants all to be saved. And so when he stands between his people and brings judgments on those that would come against him, it is not because he is evil. It is not because he is vindictive. Some of you may have gotten the wrong vision of who God is, and he's just sitting up there in the clouds waiting for you to walk by and mess up so he can zap you and have your car break down and your water heater start leaking in your house, your hot water tank, and all sorts of problems to go wrong with your health. He's just waiting to give you a hard time and curse you. That is not who our God is. If he does bring judgment against anybody, it is done out of love. Love because he is protecting his children from evil or love when his children do wrong because he loves them too much to allow them to continue on on a path to destruction. And he is willing to do what it takes to bring them back into the place of blessing because he desires to bless them. You say, what started off as loving kindness being this wishy-washy thing is starting to sound a little more like why a man stands up to be a man. Why he would be willing to get up every day and go to work for his family, perhaps at a job that he does not enjoy. Why he's willing to protect his family, even when it risks the ire of civilization. And that, that does not perhaps sound like you are standing with a weapon on a battle line. But when you make the decision that's unpopular to keep things out of your home, to protect your home from those evil influences, you are standing because of loving kindness. When you're willing to set boundaries on children that desperately do not want boundaries, when you're trying to set boundaries on your teens that desperately do not want boundaries, and they're angry with you, you're not doing it because you're mad at them, though they don't understand that at the moment. You're doing it because of the loyal, loving kindness in your heart, and you are not willing to allow them to walk away. And God forbid that we should ever have to stand between danger and those that we love, but a man who is motivated by loving kindness, whether he's, whether he's the pinnacle of physical perfection and a trained marksman and fighter, or, or whether he's just going to put himself in between as a shield, that is why real men do it. Not for their own boasting, not for their own accolades, but because of those that they love. If we can mimic God's loving kindness towards his people, as we seek to be men in our families, as we seek to be men among our peers, among those that we work with, among those in our classrooms, among those in our community, if we can mimic that loving kindness, you will see us walking in that pathway of blessing and putting a smile on God's face. We're going to talk about judgment. We're going to talk about righteousness as other things. But let's just Consider and pause for a moment on what it is that God is asking us to do just in these few verses. What should we take away from it? We need to examine what we're glorying in. We need to examine what we're celebrating. We need to examine what it is that we are finding our satisfaction and our happiness in. Where is it? Where is it for you? God begins the warning against these low ideals, these temporary fading things. People are wise, but some of you have lived long enough to see wise people sadly fade due to dementia, Alzheimer's. You've seen some of that. It is not lasting on this earth. Perhaps you've known people that were mighty, but as age has gone on, or perhaps even as an illness has touched their body, it has faded. That's a striking thing to the, see the men in your life maybe perhaps fathers or grandfathers, uncles, 
coaches that you looked up to age to the point where they can no longer do the things that they did. It's a startling thing to see, the frailty of it, because it is a fading thing. And riches, riches, as you well know, are very temporary. Here today, gone tomorrow, never enough of them. And so he warns us away from these ideals that people often glory in. And so I ask you, where do you find your value? Where do you find your satisfaction? Is it in all of your degrees and everything that you know and and how you're able to kind of show off because you know a little bit about everything? Is it in your ability to get stuff done? Are you the hardest worker? Are you physically powerful? Have you cultivated a body to be envied or desired? Do you have resources and wealth and connections? And do you shop at certain places and eat at certain places and dress a certain way and, oh, we don't go there. And you feel because of these things that you have made it, I want you to know that you are glorying in the wrong place. Where is it? These fading, fickle things are perhaps there now, but they're, they're, they're just a, a little bit, a sampling. Because remember, where does wisdom come from? God. And where does might come from? God. And where do riches come from? The power to gain wealth. It comes from the Lord. And so if these things, or anything else, it could be something completely different than this, that is bringing you joy right now, then there's something that needs to be changed. What is bringing you joy right now? Let let me rephrase that. What can't you wait to get home and do? When you're upset, when you're discouraged, when you're disappointed, when you're hurt, what do you run to? These things will indicate what our heart has already run after. And we could find ourselves boasting about the wrong thing. Let's examine what it is that we're glorying in. Second of all, we need to grow our relationship with God. God says, boast in this, that you know me. Can I tell you right now, whether you're wise or mighty or rich, if you know God, you've already won. If you know Christ as Savior and your sins are forgiven, you have eternal life. You already won the game. Regardless of what happens now, you've won. You've won. You will live forever in God's heaven, in his presence, enjoying all of his goodness. And it is far better than any of us can imagine. I know some of you got your your theology like I did from Looney Tunes. You're not going to be in a white little sheet bathrobe like Porky Pig playing a harp, sitting on a cloud all day wishing that there was something better to do. That is not what God has waiting for us. It is something far better, which is outside of the scope of what we're talking about today. But if you know the Lord in a saving way, then you have already won. Your sins are forgiven. You've been welcomed into God's family. And we know God through the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus speaking to his disciples the night before he dies. He's speaking to his closest followers in John chapter 14 and verse number 6. And he says to them, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. But every man that comes to the Father through Jesus gets to the Father. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is only one way to God, and it is through the Lord Jesus Christ, but it is a way open to all. And so if you don't yet know him as Savior, I want you to know that God gave his Son out of his great loving kindness for you that he might die on that cross, not by accident, not because the Jewish people betrayed him, not because Judas was disappointed, not because the Romans were scared of him. He died on that cross, giving himself up as a sacrifice, laying his life down, shedding his own blood as payment for the debt that you and I owed. You see, sin must be judged and sin must be paid for because God is holy. He is not someone to just take the wrongs that you and I have thought or said or done and sweep them under the rug. I used to use this illustration, and now perhaps it's becoming less and less appropriate, but would you want a judge that allows criminals to go free when they're guilty? I hope you would say no, especially if you were the one that was wronged. Would you want the judge to say, well, 
I know you did this crime, but since I love you, criminal, I'm going to allow you to just go free. Would that be a just judge? Is that someone you want calling the shots? Not me. Not me. And in the same way, God, though he loves us with an everlasting love, he cannot just pretend that our sins did not happen because he is righteous and he does judge and he delights in those things as well. And so instead of sweeping them under some sort of cosmic rug and pretending they weren't there or shoving them in the closet, no, instead he pays for them and sending his own son. That's what God did for you. And if you believe on him today, you will know God, not just about him, but have a relationship with him. He will adopt you into his family and, and he will come and live in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. Like all relationships, God, no different, knowing him well takes time and intentionality. This idea of understanding God and knowing him and that we can be excited about that, that we can hang our hat on that, that that can be the thing in which we find our happiness and satisfaction, that we can glory in that, that is not going to happen by accident. There's a million distractions. There are a million distractions in this world. And most of them are, are directly delivered into your house or into your pocket with little bells and attention engineers getting you hooked on all of their little dopamine apps. You and I, if we're going to know God well, we're going to have to set aside some time. We're going to have to remove some things so we can put in the most important things and spend time with them. It looks like praying and reading his word, worshiping, singing to him or playing music, coming to his house and fellowshipping with his other children. It comes from making it a priority. But I promise you, all the other things that you and I might glory in, they all come from God. And how much more important is it to love our Father than just the things that our Father gives us? Lastly, let's adopt loving kindness as a principle for life. Let's adopt loving kindness as a principle for life. If you already know the Lord, he says, I want you, because he delights in loving kindness, I want you to boast in that. Be excited about that. Choose to love in action, whether it's your family, your friends, your church members, or your community. Protect and provide for them, even if it costs you something. Keep your promises. Be faithful. This is God's loyal love that he demonstrated in protecting his children that you and I can live in. It looks like God restoring Israel when they were broken, so we should restore the broken people in our lives. It looks like God forgiving the children of Israel when they were wrong and they repent, and it looks like you and I forgiving others as well. And it's good to be mighty and wise and rich, but it is not enough. I want you to choose one person. I want you to choose one person this week and plan how you can show your love to them. Let's be intentional about it. You may already know who that is. You may have somebody that you know is hurting right now, and they need some encouragement. Maybe God brought somebody to your mind just as we were talking about this. When the next conflict comes up, choose love rather than getting your way or being right. When it's time to stand up to evil, whether it's the influences of this evil trying to invade the hearts and minds, of us and those that we love, or whether, God forbid, it should be physical evil. Don't do it because you hate what's in front of you. Do it because you rather you love what's behind you, which is those that God has given you and your loved ones. As we start to think about what it means to be a man, let us be careful not to just adopt what the world says, but what God says. For he began not just his opinion in verse 23 back in Jeremiah 9, but he said, Thus saith the Lord, and he ends with, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord which exerciseth loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Would you bow your heads with me and close your eyes for just a moment? Thank you for your good attention today. In our church, we have what we call a time of invitation where we invite you to act on what it is that God has spoken to you about. And I don't know what it is that the Lord may have spoken to you about. Perhaps you're here today and you don't yet know Christ as Savior. 
And this idea of knowing God is somewhat unfamiliar to you. Maybe you're even a sort of a church person, but it's always been about going to church and doing the church things and saying the, the, the words and singing the songs. But you, you don't think that you have a true saving relationship with Christ. You can't remember a time when you personally prayed and asked him to forgive your sins and be your savior. I want you to know today can be the day when you solve that. When you come to the Lord in prayer and say, I believe that Jesus died for my sins. Lord, save me. And that simple prayer, understanding that you are a sinner in need of a Savior and that a Savior came and that he did not stay dead when he died for us, but he rose from the grave, that simple truth will bring you eternal life and bring you near to that holy God. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. Some people will probably be praying in their seats. Some may even come forward at this altar to pray. But if that's you and you don't yet know Christ, but you'd like to know you're not sure that you're saved, but you'd like to be sure. You'd like to leave here today with some peace, finally in your heart, peace about what's going to happen to me after this life is over. Just slip out of your seat in a moment. I'll be here at the head of this aisle. Come and let me know and say, Pastor, I, I'd like to be saved today. Someone will take you aside separately, a gentleman with a gentleman, a lady with a lady, and they'll show you from God's word how you can know for sure that you're saved. If you're here today, and maybe you're in the same situation as me, God has given you influence perhaps in your home as a father or a grandfather or, or maybe in some other way, but he's given you influence over boys. And you think, how in the world am I supposed to help them in this world grow up to be the right kind of men? Today, we've heard it from God's own mouth as he's written it in his word and as we've looked at it. It's in loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness and not settling for any lesser things. Maybe you've been struggling with what it means to even be a man after God's own heart. And God has gotten your attention today. Would you say yes to him? As you begin to shift what it is that you find your value in and what it is that you get excited about and make the time to make it the right things. Perhaps you're here today and your relationship with God is not really a growing one, but you want it to be. Maybe loving kindness isn't really a principle for your life. You've perhaps got a lot of judgment and righteousness, but maybe not a lot of loving kindness. Whatever it is, would you say yes to the Lord? Father, take this time of invitation. Work in the hearts of your people. Work in the hearts of those that don't yet know you to draw them to salvation. In Jesus' name, amen.